And it says, my brothers and sisters, that's, that's us. That's incorporated everybody. You know, so nobody's missed out. Even mums, dads, you know, everybody's a brother and a sister. Okay? When, uh, when Jesus' his mother came and his brothers and sisters came and the disciples said, oh, your mother's outside and your brothers and sisters, they've come to see you. And he says, you know, tell that woman who is my brother and who is my sister. All these and whoever does the will of my Father, whoever does the will of my Father, is my brother and my sister. Not anybody is my brother and sister. Only the ones that are doing the will of my Father. Okay? So if you want to be a brother or sister to Jesus, then you've got to do the will of the Father. It's not rocket science. We've got to do the Father's will. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to him. In some, it says that you might be married to him. So, my wife's not here, but I want you to work this one out. If I'm married to, or going, I'm proposed to the bride, I'm the bride, I'm proposed to the groom, then I can't be married to somebody else. So, how, how can I be married to my wife and be going to be married to Jesus? It's quite clear, it says that you belong to him. You belong to another. You're going to be married to another, which is Jesus. While I'm an individual, I can be um, going to get married to Jesus. But then I physically get married here on earth, and what the Word of God says, then we become as one. So as one, we're still going to be married to Jesus. Singularly, I'm going to be married to Jesus. Together, we're no longer two people, we're one. So, as one, we are now, one of us, going to get married to Jesus. Don't ask me how God works this one out, because he says we become one. But then Jesus said, Father, I pray that they be one with you, as I am one with you. So spiritually, we become one with God. And this is why the one thing that we set this church up for and I pray for every day, is that we have a people of one heart, one mind, one spirit. God's heart, God's mind, and God's spirit. Because we belong to him. Amen? Okay. So you died to the Lord through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Why are we here? Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Hallelujah. <laughs> now you love this. The women will anyway. Your wife does not need someone to give, every, give her everything she thinks she wants. She needs a man who has died to self and seeks first the kingdom of God daily and becomes more Christ-like every day. So she is cared for, protected, guarded, governed over, guided by someone who has sought the kingdom of God, and then put first in his life God. This is why over the weeks God's been saying, but <coughs> listen, and I, I defy you to find it, nowhere in the Bible is the woman commanded to love her husband. It's suggested that she loves, suggested that we love one another. But the man is actually commanded to love his wife. 
Why would the man be commanded to love his wife and not the woman? It's for this simple reason. As Carl's been teaching over uh, the last about the left and the right hand side, the woman works with her emotions. Because she's designed by God to, re to work with emotions. A man works in the physical realm. This is why it's complicated us for us men. <laughs> we, we kind of uh, think, I don't get it. <laughs> because we're not emotional. But the reason the man is the head of the household and God put the authority in the man is simply that. It's so that we don't get emotional when we're dealing with things. We can't deal with things in our emotions. But a woman isn't supposed to. Although she reacts emotionally. So, if I've got cold orders, we've got, we got the left hand and we've got the right hand. And on the, the left hand, it talks about physical. There's a physical submission of man to God, or should be. And this is why God says, the man is the head of the woman, and Christ is head of the man. So that a woman can react <coughs> emotionally, the man has to be submitted to God, physically. The man has to submit himself to God so that the man hears God every single day, and then the woman emotionally reacts to that. She can't act physically. She has to act emotionally. But the emotions won't come until the physical is done. And so physically, man gets before God and man... These two may pray individually, but look at the power when you pray together. You, one can destroy a thousand, but two can destroy ten thousand. And this is why I'm praying that you understand in this church that... We've got to be of one heart, one mind, one spirit. We've got to. Because all the time we're fighting our flesh, but if we're submitted to the Spirit of God first and foremost, then, you see, if a man is submitted to God and prays to God and hears God and talks to God on a daily basis, then the woman has got the confidence in that man that is healing God. But if you're not, her emotions, you know, you, you'll know when a woman trusts the man that is submitted to God. She has no choice. She has no choice but to submit. Why? Because her body is designed to emotionally react to a person submitted to God. We're not talking physical here. We're talking for the kingdom of God. A lot of times, people will get frustrated because we see them. I, I, I remember when I first got married and we first getting into the things. And, and uh, my, my wife used to say, oh, have you heard Kenneth Copeland? Oh, oh, what he's sharing is absolutely awesome. Oh, have you got to hear T.D. Jakes. You've got to hear what T.D. Jake said. It's absolutely awesome. I'm thinking, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, I'm your husband. Yet, yeah, wow, <coughs> have you heard? And she'd go through these men of God. And everyone, I realise in the end, these are men that are submitted to Almighty God. And her emotions are reacting to that submission. She didn't fancy him. She didn't want to... Uh, be like, but her emotions are automatically submitting to a man of God that is submitted to God. That's how it works. It has to happen. Because God has created a woman that she submits to him. Now, the, the, the way it works is the more Christ-like we become as men, 
the more attractive you become to women because what attracts women is your generosity, your long suffering, your gentleness, your kindness, your generosity. These are all things that Jesus has got that make you attractive. And so when you hear uh, your wife or a woman say, oh, have you heard the latest from? It's because that person is a person submitted to Almighty God and their emotions are reacting to that submission of that man. So daily, God commands the man, you love your wife and if you love her enough, you'll do whatever's necessary to seek me first. I'm not married to Mandy. We are together. We are partners. We've got a physical piece of paper that says that we're married as far as man's concerned, but that's not what makes you married. It's a, it's a unity of your spirit unto God that you both love him with all your heart and all your soul and you just want to seek first the kingdom of God. Well, how can a woman react? It works for a man as well as a woman, but it says in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 3, I think it is. Wives, even if your husband is not walking according to the word, then without you saying a word, without you saying anything, without you nagging him that he's doing this wrong and doing that wrong and he should be doing this and he should be doing this, without a word, He'll be won over by your godly conduct. Without you saying your word, <coughs> he'll be won over by your conduct. It's going to work exactly the same with a man. More so with a man, because a woman responds emotionally. The reason I'm saying all this is because it brings me to Jesus did not die on the cross. He died in the Garden of Gethsemane. The moment he said, I can't, I don't want to do this. Father, if this cup could be taken from me, he's sweating blood because he knew what was coming. He knew he was going to be whipped and beaten and crucified. He said, if, if you could take this away, take it away, Father. I don't want to go through this. This is where he died. But not my will be done. But your will, Father. That's the moment Jesus died. Physically he died on the cross. But Jesus died the moment he said, Your will be done, Father. Not mine. Amen. You will die the moment you say, Your will be done. Your will, Father, not mine. I'm getting up this morning to serve you. Whatever you say, whatever. I'm not here to, to serve my wife. I'm not here to serve my brothers or sisters. I'm here to serve you. And serving God and doing his will above your wants and your needs and what you want and serving the kingdom of God automatically brings everything else. He says... Because if you seek first my kingdom, all these things that you're going on that you want and you don't want and you need and you could have and the big house and the car and the holidays and everything that you want and all these things will be added on to you. But you seek first my kingdom. Now if you want to truly die, then seek first the kingdom of the God. You will never, ever, ever succeed in God, until you can say the same as Jesus. Father, not my will, but your will be done. The moment you die to yourself, that everybody will respond emotionally. Has to. You've got no choice. Because that's how God set up the kingdom. You show how much you love God by how much you put his kingdom first over yours. You can't love anybody with God's love until you know how to put his kingdom first. Until we can say, God's will be done, not ours. We will never know 
how to love. <coughs> Loving your wife is not giving in to her wants. It's knowing how to give her what she needs. And what she needs is a man submitted to Almighty God. That he is, will be doing. There, there is not a person here that has been born again, filled with the Spirit of God, that cannot, 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 cannot react to a person submitting to God's kingdom. It's impossible. If you don't react to it, you ain't born again. Trust me, your spirit has to react to somebody submitted totally to the kingdom. It has to. That's if you're born again. Many people say, I'm a Christian. But we read first that it says, we're here to bear fruit. This is why we're here. This is why we're submitted to the kingdom of God. is to bear fruit. So if we're not long-suffering, and uh, Galatians... Galatians 5, verse uh, um, uh, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Self Against such things there is no law. Amen? Now, we say, I need the gifts of God. So that I can do this, I can do that, I can get this, I can get that. No, it isn't. You need the gifts of God to bear <coughs> fruit. So that the, the rest of the world and your brothers and sisters can see the fruit of God. And your husband and wives can see the fruit of God in you. If they can't see the fruit, then this is what happens. Uh, verse 24 says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, then there will be fruit. There will be fruit if you abide in God's word. If you don't, there's not going to be any fruit. Uh, Luke 13, 69 says, Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally he said to the gardener, I waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down, it's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year. I'll give it special attention. Plenty of fertiliser. If we get fixed next year, fine. If we don't, then cut it down. You see, these things happen to you in life. So that you can prove the fruit of God is growing in you. If, if nothing's happening and everything's going perfect for you, you're probably missing the kingdom of God. You're all wrapped up in your own kingdom. If everything's going perfect. You can't walk in the kingdom of God without being proven. God doesn't test you. He proves you. So that you can say to others, listen, I know where you're at. I know what you're going through. But this is how I got out of it. By submitting myself to God. And as I'm submitting myself to God, then he did this and he did that and he, he enabled him. And you start to bear fruit because you're abiding in his word. And others can see your fruit and say, oh, yeah. I think it was Sean the other day who was talking and he says, he's tasted what God can do and he's good. And he wants more. He's tasted it. When the spies went into the, um, against God's orders, Moses sent spies to spy out the land to see if it could be taken. And God didn't say, go and see if you can take the land. He said, go and take the land. Ten come back, 
with a bad report and two come back with a good report. But this is what Joshua and Caleb said. I've been to the land and I've seen. It's just how God said. It's filled with milk and honey. And the fruit, the grapes, it, 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 it takes two of us to carry a bunch of grapes back. They're that big. And I've tasted the fruit of the land. And it's good. Let's go and take it. Now, for our God is well able. <laughs> I'm tasting it. Let's go get I want some more. The reason you bear fruit of God is so that people will taste <coughs> that fruit and say, I want some more. I've tasted healing. Trust me, it's good. And I want some more. I've tasted prosperity. And it's good. And I want some more. I've tasted the things of God. And it's good. I've tasted forgiveness. And it's good. It's so, so good. I want some more. I'm all wrapped up in guilt. I'm all wrapped up in it. I'm all wrapped up in it. But I've tasted forgiveness. And as I've tasted forgiveness, I want some more. And now there's not one of us that is going to get it right. You can't. It's impossible. You're in the flesh. And the flesh is going to mess it up. But if you want to get it less wrong, have a daily submission to God and say, your will be done, not mine. Your, and I know with Adam and Sam, what they shared earlier, and we all get to this point, we say, I've tried everything, Lord. I've done everything. But I'm submitting that your will be done in this situation. I can't do anymore. Let your will be done. And even if it looks bad, even if even the kind of make a choice that I don't want to make, it's your will. You see, the confidence as as a leader, I wanna I wanna give over to other people jobs within the church, give the church to those that can take it further. So that you know, I can do other things. But I can't give it to somebody that is not submitted to God. I've got to be convinced that they're submitted, that the kingdom of God is first and foremost in their life. I'm irresponsible to God if I give it to somebody that hasn't submitted totally to the kingdom of God. And that they know <coughs> there is nothing I wouldn't do for the kingdom. There's nothing I wouldn't sacrifice for the kingdom. I sacrifice everything I've got for the kingdom. Those are the ones I'm going to give. See, those that are bearing fruit. And so it's not a matter of saying, oh, I've dumped this load on somebody and walk away. Because it'll kill them. But once I see them bearing fruit and they're coming through these areas and they're defying everything that Satan is throwing, I say, wow, man, that person is just the one I want to encourage the next person coming up. Because that's how you have to be. You have to be submitted to Almighty God. So the whole reason we're here and the whole reason that God says is so that you bear fruit of the Spirit. Mark chapter 11, verse 12 to 14. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf, a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say, the next morning they went fast and it would shrivel up and die. <gasps> that fig tree that you cursed yesterday has died, Lord. Wow. Now why would Jesus curse a fig tree? Because it didn't bear fruit. 
look up fig trees, <coughs> exercise for you, Google it if you like. But fig trees don't bear the leaves until they're bearing fruit, or shouldn't. The leaves are so big, they protect the fruit from the heat of the sun and everything else. So if you see leaves on a fig tree, there should be fruit. And the, there was none when he got there. Because it's like, oh, look, that fig tree, it, it's covered in leaves. Well, there must be fruit. And now it's not season yet. But it doesn't have leaves unless it's got fruit. Got there, no fruit. Are we Christians that are betraying with our leaves that we have fruit? Are we having a Oh, praise God, everything, oh, God is such a good God, hallelujah. Awesome God, awesome God. But we're going to have fruit. And people are coming, wow. I remember uh, in the early days, um, my father was trying to start a church up in Redditch. And God gave him a, a word saying, yeah, I haven't called you to Redditch. You stay in Birmingham and do what you're doing in Birmingham. Because they had a very big church in Birmingham. In fact, it was 500, at least 500, wasn't it, Jill? In Birmingham. <laughs> but he's determined to do something over here. So, he moved several families over here and tried to start a church over here with the backing of the church in Birmingham. And nothing was happening. And because of my anointing, he used to say to me, Adrian, would you come and do a miracle meeting for us, and a healing meeting? I said, yeah, of course we'll do. So I went, we'd do a healing meeting, miracles were happening, people were getting healed, and then they'd go to his church and find out, oh, it doesn't happen here. It's only happened at the miracle meeting. And so they would say, there is no fruit. <coughs> we saw the leaves and we all heard the worship and the team and everything. We, we saw the leaves but when we got there we, got, we didn't see any fruit and left. So it filtered out again. And then it asked me to do another one and it built up again. And then to find out the fruit that should be there wasn't there. And God said to me one day, son, I'm trying to teach your father to listen to me <coughs> and stay in Birmingham, but you're bailing him out. Mm -hmm. If you don't stop doing this, mm -hmm. I'll stop the blessings coming to you so you can't bless him. <laughs> okay. So I said, Dad, I uh, can't do it. Oh, what? I said, I God tell me, no. In about, within less than 12 months, the church in Birmingham just fizzled out and died. And what he was doing in Redditch fizzled out and died. <coughs> the moment people don't see the fruit, so you can tell anybody you're a Christian. You can tell them that you go to church every week. You can tell them how great it is. <laughs> it's in the Bible. I've got, I've got three hmm. electronic. I've got three of this, man. <laughs> three, and it's got all the notes and all the, and you can change it to the Greek and the Hebrew. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> so I must be a tremendous Christian. makes no difference how many Bibles you got, how many linear concordances, uh, doesn't make a difference. Is a fruit in your life. You tell everybody this and you tell everybody, but can they see fruit? Can they see long suffering? Can they see gentleness? Can they see your loving kindness? Can they see your generosity? Uh, on the island of Malta, doing a healing crusade, 
the, the uh, pastor was, in fact, the same pastor who did the crusade for, uh, I'm going over to Australia uh, to um, minister to two of his churches in May in Australia and two in New Zealand. He sought me out and found me. <laughs> but nearly 20 years ago on the island of Malta, an evangelist had been over sharing and said how tight-fisted and stingy the Maltese people were. And they were very upset by the time I got there. And he said his tides are down and everything. And he says, I'm scared to, to teach on it because, you know, they're already upset about the giving and everything else. <coughs> and I said, if they're upset about giving, they ain't born again. What do you mean? They are born. I said, no. There is not a born again, spiritual Christian that has a problem in giving. You may not have the ability to give, but you still want to. You're desperate to. You hear the needs in this church and say, if only I was in a position, I would meet that need tomorrow. I would do it tomorrow, Lord, if I could. So it's not the fact that you don't want to, it's we have the ability at times. But it doesn't mean every born again spirit filled Christian will want to give and give and give and give. We get the ability by tithing and doing the right thing with the small things and then God entrusts you with the big things. So it will come. There's a process that we go through of bearing fruit. It doesn't come because we want to win the lottery or float in the check out of the sky. It comes by perseverance in the word of God and giving whenever I can. And giving out of my hurts and, and giving out of my need. I, I, I can sow out of my need. And somebody told me many, many years ago, said, if you've got a need, then sow a seed. If you want your need met, make sure you sow a seed. And it, the size of the seed is not matter. We talked about, oh, Shirley gave me a fabulous, um, last week, talk, talking to Shirley. Um, my late wife's mum and she uh, our car was talking on uh, the mustard seed listen to this this is awesome when she was a little girl <laughs> her dad, they, they lived off the uh, the land the, they you know, grown their own crops and everything else and, and her dad used to Grow mustard seeds. So mustard seeds. The mustard seed is so small, it's like dust. When you say it's the smallest seed in the world, and they and he he would grow mustard all over the land. He would grow mustard, and it would grow thick and green. And once it was about waist height, they would dig it into the soil. Just. Put it down and dig it into the soil. Because the mustard used to fertilise the land. And it also, they didn't have pesticides and everything in there to protect the It would kill bacteria that attacked the crop. That was the mustard seed. So they would sell the mustard seed, grow it to fertilise the soil, to uh, protect the crops of whatever you sow next. Oh, I, I, <laughs> get this, because this is awesome. If you have the faith, just as a mustard seed, and you say to this mountain, be thou removed. You see, what God does is a process. They had to sow the mustard seed. That didn't give them the harvest. The mustard seed that they were sowing was to fertilise the ground so that when they sow a real crop then they got a real juicy crop because the, the, that little seed that they sowed grew up and God said no, 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 no I still don't want you to have to eat mustard 
for the rest of your life. What I want you to do is use what's come up. It may only seem a little bit, but use it to fertilise the ground. Sow it again. Sow it again. Trust me. I know what I'm doing, it says. Sow it again. So they're digging into the ground. And it would kill all the bacteria that's when they sow the next crop, the next seeds, the ground was ready to receive it and ready to feed it and ready to fertilise it. Hear me, church. There is a process that God takes you through. So that when you sow what you can, then he'll give you some more and he'll say, no, 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 no. Say that again. Say that again. If you trust me, when, when, when Jesus stood at the treasury box and said, um, all the Pharisees are dumping all the money in it because they were loaded and look how great I am, how much I'm giving. And Jesus says, Oh, I want to bring you to. You see that widow woman that's just come in? She sown her two mites. They missed it. Jesus didn't. Why would her two mites be more than what everybody else gave? Because she got nothing to live on for the rest of the week. God wouldn't let her down. That if I sow everything I've got, I know you're not going to let me down. How do you get that kind of faith? By sowing a little. Something you desperately need. And you think, I'm going to sow that into your kingdom. And you sow it into the kingdom of God. And then something comes out of it. You think, ooh, that's it. I'm all right. And God says, no, 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 go on. If you sow that as well, you're going to get a real bumper of a harvest. Okay. You, you met all my needs the last time. I'm sure you're going to do it again. And you sow again and sow again. Until eventually you're thinking, I've bore fruit of God. I'm a generous giver. So there's a process. How does that process come? By daily seeking God. So I said to the pastor, Matthews, I said, your church isn't stingy. It's just got lack of knowledge. My children are destroyed through lack of knowledge. So I taught them, like I'm teaching you this morning, how to tithe and how to give. And God keeps his promises. He said, that particular day, in the history he had the church, the tithes had never been so big. The congregation had never been so small. But the tithing had never, ever been so big. All God's children need is knowledge of how to do it. Then you start to bear fruit. And what I'm teaching you this morning, if you'll only listen, is that God says, you're married to my son. And if you will lay down your life in your garden of Gethsemane, I don't know where your garden of Gethsemane is at the moment in time, but if you will say this morning, Father, I don't want to go through this. I don't want to go through this hassle. I don't want to feel this rejection anymore. I don't want to feel this pain anymore. And I know what's coming. I know there's going to be more. And I, I know the pressure's gone. And I don't want to go through this anymore. And if you just think about it and say, well, no, my will be done. Your will. Whatever is going to benefit the kingdom. That's the moment you'll die. Your physical body might take a few years down the line. Jesus' physical body took a few, few uh, weeks later, I think it was, from the Garden of Gethsemane. But that's when he died. He didn't die on the cross. That was his physical body. Jesus died in the Garden of Gethsemane. Sweating blood and crying out to God. 
Father, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this pain. I don't want, I know what's coming and I don't want to do it. But not my will. But your will be done. If we can say that this morning, you'll die today. You'll physically die today. And it won't matter. Trust me, I know. That the pain that we go through, a dead man doesn't feel any pain. You can kick him, you can put your cigarette and upstairs on him, you can do whatever you like. What do you call a dead man? You can call him whatever you like because he can't hear you. You can say whatever you like. Do whatever you like. He ain't going to feel it. He's dead. That's why God wants you to die to yourself. The reason that you're feeling pain is because yourself is still alive. And this is why God says, if they persecute you for my name's sake, our persecution is coming for our, for our name's sake. We think we're being persecuted for God. But we're being persecuted for our own stupidity, our own stupid men, and the own stupid things that we do. And we say, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. You're being persecuted because you're a stupid Christian, with a stupid man, and doing stupid things. But if you were submitted to God daily, then you might get persecuted for the kingdom of God. Then God says, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll cut you back. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I'll cut you back, King. Whatever they say and do. I, I will, I'll take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, say the Lord. But I will vindicate you. I will vindicate you. And people will know that you're mine. So, this morning... Let's not get persecuted for our own stupid war. Let's get persecuted. <coughs> if you go to these places, especially these Muslim countries now, uh, where Christians are being put to death, and you'll know what persecution is for the kingdom of God. And if you're in those countries, and I've been to these places, if you're in those countries, it takes a lot to say I'm a Christian. Over there. Any fool will say it. But it's getting to a point that people will own. It's getting to a point now that people will only wear the cross if they really mean it. Because the persecution becoming. The, I'm not against people wearing crosses, but remember this Jesus wore a cross, but he wore it on his back. You've got to take up the cross and you've got to bear it. For the kingdom's sake, not for your sake. So let's die this morning to what we want, what we think, and let's live to what God wants, to what God thinks, to where God wants to take us. And we do that by bearing fruit. You'll only get it by some daily submission, daily submission, daily submission, daily submission. And once you get to the end of the year, you'll think, thank you, got through another day. Go to sleep for a few hours and start the morning with, here we go again, Lord. <laughs> you better guide me this morning, Holy Spirit, because it's your kingdom I'm living for. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that your truth goes deep into our hearts so that the man can love his wife and the wife can respond emotionally to that law. That we die to ourselves and we live for your kingdom. That your will be done in my life, Lord, not mine. <coughs> when Lainey came home to be with you, Lord, my kingdom said, I want to get out. I want to go home too. I don't want to stay here. 
But I had to say, Lord, not my will be done, but yours, Father. The blessing, oh Lord, the blessing from doing your will and not mine. Oh, awesome God. Awesome God. I thank you in Jesus' precious name. <clears throat> the words that uh, you may, may not have prayed then will show according to your fruit.